ice. It was all one could see for miles upon miles. Even the trees blended in with the white surroundings covered in snow. Even the gray sky seemed to blend in so that all one saw at any point was a field of white and gray. However, one feature stuck out like a sore thumb. A herd of woolly mammoths were trudging their way through the snow and ice, their brown hair signaling to anybody in the vicinity that they were there. While other animals had adapted to the climate with white fur, the ranging mammoths had not. They didn't need to rely on camouflage for protection, after all. Their humongous size and sharp tusks and group-based movements were sufficient protection for a mammoth. However, a pack of other living beings slowly approached the mammoths without their knowing. Covered in white pelts from previous victims of the hunt, these humans were prepared to take down the ultimate game. Mammoth hunting was not an everyday occurrence, rather, it was a special occasion. They readied their spears tipped with the horns from woolly rhinoceros in preparation for the charge. And, indeed, after a bloody confrontation that saw members of their own group be slain, the hunters had managed to get their kill. A young female mammoth. After catching their breath, the hunters prepared to get to work on their objective, taking the large tusks off the mammoths. The goal of the hunt was not for food, no. The hunters already had plenty of different types of food. The goal was the tusk, which could be used for more building material. However, as the hunters work through the bloody affair, the howling of wolves freezes them and chills them to the bone. Or, at least, it would have if they weren't already in what was possibly the iciest conditions one could live in. A pack of wolves hesitantly approached the hunters. Locked in by glaciers on all sides, the wolves and the humans had found themselves encountering each other time and time again. In order to survive, the two species had to come to a sort of understanding. The hunters tore off a piece of meat from the mammoth and tossed it to the wolves, eagerly swallowing up their meal. After the feeding time, the wolves dashed away, but one hunter could swear he could see the pack stalking them as they made their way back home through the corner of his eye. The hunters reached their settlement that was thriving more than one would expect in this region. Hundreds of people were going about their business, building dwellings, cooking, stoking fires, and so on. Dancers celebrated the arrival of the new building resources. A woman, wearing a sort of bone crown or tiara, runs to her partner in a hug, happy to see him again and to congratulate him on a successful hunt. Other members of the tribe mourned those who were unable to return. And as the sun set and the people settled down to sleep, the howl of wolves spelled uncertainty for the future. Every day, day by day, it seemed to be getting colder and food was becoming more scarce. While this was an imagined scenario, there is much about these people that might seem too fictitious to be true, but, in fact, in the Paleolithic period during the worldwide fiercely cold Ice Age, a group of humans lived in a refugia between the glaciers all the way in the North Pole. These were the Yana people, also known as the ancient North Siberians. And this is their story. In order to understand the people who lived on what is today the bank of the Yana River in the Arctic Circle, we must first move our attention further away to Central Asia. 50,000 years ago, while the Ice Age continued, a group of hunter-gatherer people entered the region from the southwest, possibly from somewhere in the Iranian Plateau. These people, represented by hybrid specimens with recent Neanderthal admixture found at Zlatikun, or Golden Horse, 
entered not only Central Asia, but became widespread as far as modern-day Czechia in Eastern Europe, and possibly as far as Ust-Ishim in Central Asia. These people migrated even further northwards into Siberia, a region that brings up imagery of barren wastelands. However, the region of Siberia was actually relatively habitable during the Ice Age, which facilitated this migration. At some point between 50,000 years ago and 45,000 years ago, a split began to take place within these Zlaty Kun communities. To the eastern range of their domain, the Zlaty Kun became what we consider to be Eastern Eurasians. They will go on to be a component in the formation of East Asians. To the west, however, these Latikun communities diverged into the Western Eurasians, a lineage that included the famous Cro-Magnon of Europe. However, this clean correlation between geography and genetics would not last. At some point, around 38,000 years ago, a group of West Eurasian hunter-gatherers had split off from their fellow West Eurasians, and instead, they began to make their way east. The reason for this eastward migration is unclear given how remote it was in the past. Perhaps some competition for resources or other issues gave way to a group making their own way into the east. Perhaps they had cultivated ties with the Eastern Eurasians to spark their movement east. Maybe it was just the result of the wanderings of people with no map and no meaningful sense of large-scale direction, or perhaps it was a gradual split due to geographic and climatic features like glaciers. How and why it happened is unknown, but by 32,000 years ago, these Western Eurasian hunter-gatherers were living on the edge of the habitable world, in a refugia around what is the Arctic Yana River today, in northeastern Siberia. They were surrounded by glaciers, possibly trapped in with other species of megafauna like woolly mammoths, reindeer, and wolves. Forgotten by the world, this population of around 500 people who, by this point in time, had picked up Eastern Eurasian mates and now had genetics of around 22% East Eurasian, and note that I mistakenly said 25% in my first Japanese documentary, would go on to produce descendants with remarkable impacts on the world. Being of the ancestral mitochondrial haplogroup U and Y haplogroup P1, Many groups can trace their genetic ancestry back to these people, who are known archaeologically as the Yana, and genetically as the Ancient North Siberians, or ANS. They are a component in the ancestry to the American Indians, who will one day make their own trek into the glaciers to populate a new land. They would be a genetic component to the Japanese, who would develop a unique culture on their island before exploding forth in a fury of industrialization. Their DNA can be found in the Mongols, who built the largest contiguous land empire the world has ever seen. The Indian, the Turk, the Iranian, the Tatar. Siberians like the Uralic Naganasan, or Paleo-Siberian Ket, all of these groups can claim to descend from this Arctic population. And of course, possibly holding the most Yana DNA, are the Europeans, from Portugal to Russia, from Scandinavia to Greece, where there are legends of a land called Hyperborea, an Arctic land inhabited by people blessed by the gods. While there is no evidence of the Yana Basin being a tropical paradise in the Arctic Circle, one can't help but wonder if the Greek myths of Hyperborea are somehow a passed-down story of the Yana, altered through the sands of time after tens of thousands of years. Caught in the refugia of the Arctic during the late glacial maximum, which began 33,000 years ago no less, the resilient Yana thrived more than one might expect. The Yana had a large variety of game to hunt and use for materials in their region. 
Based on Yana artifacts, the Yana had access to and hunted woolly rhinoceros, woolly mammoths, the Pleistocene hare, the steppe bison, horses, the musk ox, wolves, polar fox, the brown bear, the Pleistocene lion, wolverines, rock ptarmigans, and their primary source of food, reindeer. While some of these animals were hunted for food, many were used for their fur for warmth in the harsh Arctic. Indeed, throughout the Yana inhabitation of the Arctic Circle, the late glacial maximum only harshened until their inevitable end. Mammoth hunting appears to not be the Yana's primary source of game, and hunting mammoth was something that happened every few years. When hunting mammoth, it is said that the Yana specifically targeted adolescent female mammoths for their large tusk sizes. These tusks would then be used for things like building materials or weapons. The woolly rhinoceros horn, for example, would be heated by something like steam and then shaped to become the tip of their spears. Hunting for mammoths is evident through a location known as something archaeologists call the Yana Mass Accumulation of Mammoth, which has over 1,000 mammoth bones from 26 mammoths organized according to type, with 95% of the bones found there belonging to mammoths. At other Yana sites, mammoth bones make up 50% to 3.3% of the pile. The Yana hunting of mammoth is the first confirmed record of Homo sapiens hunting the great beasts, a deadly affair and something that would become a defining feature of the Ice Age. Looking at the Yana site itself, it was a relatively well-developed site with locations separated by tens or hundreds of meters over an area of over 3,500 square meters. Unlike other hunter-gatherers, the Yana appeared to be relatively settled, as the Yana settlement was made for long-term human habitation and served as a home base for thousands of years. Elements of advanced technology for the time and a developed culture can also be found. In their earliest stages, the Yana have very few blades, especially micro-blades, but flake-based stone tool-making. Hunting tools usually were made from bone and ivory, while non-hunting tools could be found made out of stone. Shaft wrenches, utensils, points, bone needles, decorations, and personal ornaments could all be found in Yana sites. Decoration is also intriguing, as the Yana had animal figurines representing mammoths or reindeer, pieces of ivory with engraved drawings of hunters or dancers, and even a piece of anthraxolite shaped like the head of a horse or mammoth. Personal decoration also appears in Yana culture, like ivory hairband ornaments, pendants created by reindeer teeth, beads made from hair bones, some of which were even painted. Not only that, the Yana used non-local amber to make some of their decoration, which is either a sign of high mobility or more likely, given the permanent state of the settlement, the Yana participated on a large-scale Stone Age trading network. The existence of this trading network suggests that, despite being isolated in a refugia, the Yana did have some sort of contact with the outside world, which makes us question why they didn't leave the harsh Arctic Circle anytime sooner than when they did. Living in a refugia with so many forms of megafauna, a unique situation was created where humans and wolves had to live closer than usual. Very often, these two species would proverbially step on each other's toes, as they both hunted the same types of prey. Especially as the last glacial maximum reached its height 26,000 years ago, both humans and wolves may have started to become desperate with wolves stalking the humans and consuming the prey the humans left behind. Over time, the wolves and the humans came closer and closer to each other, and there is even some evidence of the Yana even cohabitating with wolves. Over time, it became clear that the intelligent wolves could be used for things like hunting together. 
by roughly 23,000 years ago, the relationship between man and wolf, or rather dog, had changed forever. What had once been a rival species that kept humans awake at night in fear had become man's best friend. It was the Yana who domesticated the dog. When the last glacial maximum's height was reached 26,000 years ago, the situation in the Yana homeland was becoming unbearable and the ancient North Siberians slowly began to go their separate ways as they were pushed south by the glaciers. As we have talked about in the first Japanese video, it is around this time that a group of Yana moved south down through Sakhalin and Northeast Asia connected by the land bridge from the Lower Ice Age sea level, developing new technologies as they went like microblades, before finally arriving in Hokkaido by 25,000 years ago. As we have discussed in the first Japanese video, these Hokkaido ancient North Siberians would move down into Honshu by 20,000 years ago, and begin interactions with the local Hoabinian people that led to the ethnogenesis of the Jomon. Meanwhile, the Yana show evidence of a massive scale replacement by Eastern Eurasians. Around the time of the domestication of the dog, the Yana themselves had increased admixture with the East Eurasians as they moved south. Around 24,000 years ago, the Yana inhabiting the Yana region were now around 63% from East Eurasian lineages, and a chunk of the population went off to the east, becoming a key component to the ancestral Native Americans. Later, the inhabitants were around 75% East Eurasian, replacing the ancient North Siberians with a new descendant population we know as the ancient Paleo-Siberians. Meanwhile, at the same time, another group of ancient North Siberians maintained their genetic makeup of only around 22% East Eurasian, with some minor contributions of a West Eurasian lineage known as the Caucasian hunter-gatherers, becoming a dominant force in Central Asia and Siberia. They were called the Ancient North Eurasians, and they would create a legacy that would change the world. And, of course, everywhere the descendants of the Yana went, whether it be the Americas, Northern Siberia, or Central Asia, they brought a remnant of their time in the Arctic with them. A reminder of the harsh situations they once lived in, and the achievements they were able to make. What these people brought with them were dogs. Twenty-one thousand years ago, the land that was once the Yana settlement had been abandoned. Its original ancient North Siberian inhabitants had migrated and admixed with other populations. The last to inhabit the region would be considered ancient Paleo-Siberians rather than ANS proper. Memories of the region may linger on, an empty patch where ceremonial dances were held, the shade under an old tree, where a wolf decided it would live with man. The Paleolithic forge of sorts, where heat was used to temper tools from bone. The settlement gradually disappeared as the glaciers moved forward, turning the refugia into an uninhabitable wasteland under the ice, and its original inhabitants scattered to the winds. But just because the Yana was under the ice did not mean that they did not carry on. Just a bit to the east, we have a woman named Kalima One from 24,000 years ago, whose DNA is around 25% ANS, beginning the ancient Paleo-Siberian genome. In Japan, the descendants of the Yana play a role in the formation of the Jomon people. To the southwest, near Lake Baikal, a new culture is flourishing, known as the Malta Barret culture, inhabited by a people known genetically as the ancient North Eurasians with 75% ANS DNA. 
The descendants of the Yana will become worldwide explorers, as even 13,000 years ago, the Clovis culture of North America will be using the flaking technology very similar to their Yana ancestors thousands of years before. Siberians will begin to use their dog companions to pull sleds across the region and even into the Americas. And the ancient North Eurasians will become a key component in many other peoples, including the Proto-Indo-Europeans, who will conquer the world in waves of expansion. Though they are but a footnote in history, just a few hundred people living in an outpost on the North Pole, the Yana, the ancient North Siberians, have left a lasting impact on the world. And for what is possibly the most visible evidence of their hardships, just take a look at your dog and know that your dog is descent from those wolves that, under exceptional circumstances, lived with humans. And especially if you have the tiniest amount of Mongolian, Indo-European, Turkic, Siberian, Uralic, Japanese, or American Indian blood in you, your ancestors were part of the unique world that domesticated these friends as well.